I'm part of the Bloodhound project, so it's kind of, it's about supersonic cars, things that go really, really fast, really, really exciting. And if that was the reason for the project, that's actually quite a rubbish reason for a project. Actually, the whole project is about you guys. The whole project is to inspire the next generation of kids to think science, technology, engineering, maths is cool. Because what we just said was completely true. Everything you touch has been engineered. And everything from an iPhone to a BIC to a bridge to a car, somebody's had to think of it. And actually, engineering is this fantastically worthwhile subject. And it's, people say, you know, why, what do you find great about engineering? It's the fact that you're trying to solve problems that people don't know the answers for yet. And you kind of have this opportunity to play with all these toys and do these fantastic things. And you can keep being a kid forever and ever. People say, what's a fast car? Now, about 115 years ago, that was the world's fastest car. And actually, the Tesla was outside, was electric. This is an electric car. And it held the world land speed record, which sounds really cool, until you find out that it was 10 miles slower than the world cycling record. <laughs> but it's how things started. And, and with people say, why are we doing a land speed record car to get people excited about science, technology, engineering, and maths? And it's because of land speed records, there's this fantastic wealth of stuff you can look at. And during the history of land speed record, there have been these huge leaps from the early cars that the first three cars that broke the land speed record, none of them had an internal combustion engine. There was steam, they were electric. Then there was a diesel, then a petrol. And these huge leaps in speed when people started using aero engines, when people started using jet engines. So these massive, massive leaps in speed, and then rocket cars, and finally, in 1997, to thrust SSC. So thrust SSC in 1997 ran at 763 miles an hour. That's just a little bit faster than the speed of sound. And there's some great footage on YouTube of this car breaking the sound barrier. And, and it's the weirdest thing in the world. But when I first saw the video, you see it, and it comes across the horizon. And it's coming through a heat haze. And you think, wow, it's coming through a heat haze. And actually you go, no, 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 it's not through a heat haze. That's coming over the curvature of the Earth. And the car emerges from the curvature of the Earth completely silently. It runs past. There's this fantastic double crack of a boom as it breaks the sound barrier. And that sound was heard 20 miles away. And 10 miles away in the local school, all the fire sprinklers went off because the shock wave hit the school. All those little plastic caps on the, on the um, sprinklers <laughs> fell off. It was, it was incredible. So where we are, so we are Bloodhound. So we're a team that's been running for about eight years, and it's out of the core of that thrust as a C team. And it was kind of a, a slightly weird a weird starting point in that um, Richard Noble, Andy Green, there's an American team that um, Steve Fawcett aboard of Craig Breedlove Com was going to try and break this record. Now, Britain has held this record for quite a long time, and Richard Noble being Richard Noble and Andy Green being Andy Green didn't want to lose that record. So they went to the Ministry of Defence and said, can we have a jet engine, please? And they said, you must be joking. So Richard Noble being Richard Noble, he didn't take no for an answer. And, and basically, at the end of the conversation was, Lord Drayson at the time said, OK, if you can promise that you'll deliver an inspiring project to the schools, I will let you have some jet engines. So we have the three flight test jet engines from Eurofighter Typhoon. So we have three of the most modern engines in the Royal Air Force. And we're using that to develop a project that is completely open source. And we can share with you all these fantastic stories. So 2009. So People go, what's the most difficult bit about the car project? Keeping it on the ground. Not only do we break the land speed record, we also break the airspeed record. No aircraft has ever flown this quickly at that altitude. So people go, it's a car, it must be easy. So we have pressures on the car of 12 tons per square meter. People go, why doesn't Andy have an ejector seat? If you ejected, you're about a square meter, and somebody put 12 tons on you, you'd have quite a bad day. So it's probably a lot better for Andy to be inside the car, and we try and work really hard to make him have a good day. Now, the car weighs about 7.5 tonnes. This car here, the blues are suctions, the reds are high pressures. That car had 11 tonnes of lift. Now, if you were in a car that weighs 7.5 tonnes and you've got 11 tonnes of stuff trying to push you up, that's going to make it a pretty bad day to start off with. Where we're different, people go, no, we're educating kids, we're educating schools, but we also educate people, industry things that we do differently. So we don't have a NASA budget. We don't have this huge budget that we can tip resource in. These computational models were taking us eight to 12 me weeks to do. So we'd design a car, we'd test it in a wind tunnel, well, test it in a computational wind tunnel, 
you couldn't find a wind tunnel that would do what we needed to do, so it's all done on a computer. It would take maybe 12 weeks, two weeks to analyze, and this was our 12th iteration, and it was rubbish. So we had to think, what do we do differently? We don't have a huge budget. Computational resource is huge. So we came up with the thing we call the pointed brick. And we literally stripped the car down to the bare minimum that you need to work out, does it go up, does it go down, does it go in a straight line? And that transformed how we worked. And instead of taking almost 18 months to do 12 different car designs, we ended up doing 43 in three weeks. And that gave us this car, which is the car you saw outside earlier. It's, used, it's been modeled using a computational model that basically gave us an equation for a supersonic car. And maths is fantastic in that there are these ways of looking at stuff. Uh, you know, it's interesting. We didn't know what the problem was. We didn't really know what the question was. We just didn't want lift. We had no idea where on this car the lift was coming from. And it was so counterintuitive, the computer had to say, this is where the problem is. And literally, it came up with five variables. So there is a quadratic equation that has five variables in it, and if you press the button on the ca computer CAD system, that designs your supersonic car. And to find that thing is like this holy grail of thing, and you realize how powerful maths and science can be, that you can actually solve problems that you really don't know what the questions are you're trying to answer. Because we're a small team, we use as many tools that we can use. So this is a thing called topological optimization, which is a very long word that basically means only put metal where I need it. So that's the front suspension of the car. And on your right, on your left, is what, where, the, where the forces are going. So this thing is holding the front wheels on the car. So the car's made of carbon fiber of steel and titanium. This is a big chunk of aluminum on the front that holds the wheels on. The thing on the left is, if you had it, it was a big, huge piece of metal. The thing on the right is if you took away all the metal you don't need. And the computer literally goes and it nibbles away at all the little bits and says, you don't need metal there. You don't need metal there. It doesn't do anything. And you end up with a thing that we call the dead goat's head, because it kind of looked a bit like a dead goat's head. Now, you can't make that. Well, you can, and I'll tell you how in a second. But it's, if, you if you send that to a manufacturer and say, please make me one of those, they just laugh at you. And they say, how many millions of pounds would you like to spend? However, you can make something like that, and we have. So you use the computer to give you an idea, to give you a clue in the right direction, just to aim you and point you. And then you use your, your knowledge, your ambition, your experience to craft that into something you can do. When I said you can't make that, you can if you print it. So we use a technique on the car called additive manufacture, which used to be called 3D printing. And you've seen there are some examples that, are around, that have been around in the last few days. But basically, the computer can print whatever you can think of. Now, whether that's any good or not, you have to make that decision because the computer will print exactly what it wants to do, and it will do exactly what it's told. So if you say there is this much force on this point, it will design you a structure that, has, that will withstand that much force on that point. However, if it isn't that much force, and it's twice that much force, it will break. So you have to look at what it does. Now, this comes up as a technique with some fantastically organic shapes. There are some great structures, some great bridges that have this, and they look like tree roots. Absolutely wonderful. <coughs> We're doing something different. So the air brakes on this car are opening at 850 miles an hour. So Andy Green opens two panels that are about the size of that lector on either side of the car, faster than the speed of sound, and they're made of plastic. What holds those plastic things on are four door hinges, which look very much like the door hinges you have on your car at home. They're just a bit bigger. What we're now doing is that we're writing a program that keeps the outside looking smooth but puts a lattice on the inside. So you only have solid metal where you need it. And where you don't need that metal, you have a, this organic shape, but within the external shape. So the outside looks the same, but the inside only has strength where you need it. It gives a fantastically lightweight, strong, robust structure. And that is cutting edge. That is the future. You will come to a stage in your lives very soon where you'll literally design something, the computer will work out where it needs to be strong, and you press the button, it will print. And actually, for things like the space station, for things like remote areas where you need spare parts, having somebody email you a spare part file and you printing it for yourself is the future. And these things are so small, so cool, you can make plastic ones. You've got simplest things using um, the strimmer. So the, the type of plastic you have on a strimmer, you can melt that and you can fuse it together. There are people there that have 
very small, very cheap, very simple machines that will make you a plastic form out of that that you can just email and print. We also do low tech. So at one of the spectrum, massively high tech, F13, design supersonic car on your keyboard, low tech, B&Q, can we maintain the jet engine? So there are some great tools there with virtual reality goggles that you can go into a, a mechanism and a machine and work out, can you fit it? We have quite a unique set of people building this car of non-standard shapes and sizes, of which you'll see shortly. For us to model all that, to work out can they reach, can they do this, is massively difficult. However, that is a desktop, some cardboard, and four bits of drain pipe that mimics the rear suspension and the rocket installation of the car. Behind that is an EJ200. We put table under back of EJ200. Can you get to the way you need to change the oil? Can you get to these places? So actually, the computer is a fantastic tool, but you have to be sure you're using it in the right way. There is some fantastic technology out there, but people need not to forget that you can do 90% of the time just buy bits of paper and bits of tube. And actually, the car we're building at the moment, there are some bits we don't have in reality yet. So they are in there as bits of tube and duct tape. Can we get access? Where do we put? We're currently putting all the communications boxes in the car. They are cardboard boxes with duct tape, with little labels that says server, little label that says communications package. You can do it all in a virtual reality world. But actually, if you're trying to be really dynamic and really quick, just cutting a bit of cardboard out and seeing if it fits works really, really well. So what are we trying to do? We're going to 1,000 miles an hour. People go, why are you going to 1,000 miles an hour? We could break the land speed record going at 780. 1,000 miles an hour is there for three reasons. One, the media really like nice round numbers. And it keeps them nice and simple. Children, you, it's a really fantastic challenge. It is really, it's, it's, like, it's like Mac 1, breaking the sound barrier. What are you going to do next? Mac 1 point and a little bit doesn't really cut it. 1,000 miles an hour, 1,600 kilometers an hour. It's real, it grabs the attention. And the third thing is it's difficult. It is genuinely difficult. We don't have a nice set of requirements and rules that we can follow. We have very little regulation. This is, I'll kind of describe, when I get people to come for me for interview for jobs, they say, well, now, how much, you know, do you get much peer review? Do people look at what you're doing? Do people do much checking? I said, no, this is engineering without a safety net. We don't know what the right answer is. The only time we know this car works is when Andy Green breaks 1,000 miles an hour in 2016. And the people that work on the project, and they're everything from graduates to gnarly old PhD professors, all have an equal value to what they put into us. Some of the best ideas we've had have come from people that have been on an internship, guys that are doing sick form placements, just come up with an idea with a completely fresh set of eyes and just go, why aren't you doing it that way? The rocket and the jet. The rocket and the jet used to be the other way up. And somebody just said, why is it that way up? I said, well, that's the way it always has been. Actually, it made a lot more sense to turn it over. And in two weeks, we completely changed the design of the car because somebody put their hand up in a meeting and said, why don't you just swap them over? And there was a really good reason why it was the other way. And that when we started off, the rocket was really little. And then it got bigger and bigger and bigger. And it was just always in that place because it always is. So we're running 1,000 miles an hour. So we do naught to 60 times rubbish, naught to 100 is 15 seconds. Veyron does it in 7.9. 100 to 1,000 is 25 seconds. We are naught to 1,000 to naught in less than two minutes. And during those two minutes, we cover 11 miles. The measured mile is three and a half seconds long. Speed is a really difficult thing to get a, an idea for, but your blink reflex a fifth of a second. So everybody blink. So if you're sat in a football stadium, it would come in through one wall of the stadium and go out through the other one while your eyes were closed. It will do four and a half football stadiums a second. We have 135,000 brake horsepower. We have 20 tons of thrust. If Andy Green pulled up, he's a fighter pilot, if he decided he wanted to go airborne, it would go to 25 and a half thousand feet with 45 seconds of fuel and it would break the sound barrier at 17,000 feet. And the beauty with this is we've got all this different technology that we can share. That's our rocket. So that was a rocket firing we did almost two years ago. That was the loudest noise on planet Earth that was man-made. The only two things that have been louder were Ariane taking off or in a volcano erupting. 
That was the largest rocket in Europe. We're now working with a rocket company in Norway, and it's going to be a game changer within the space industry. We're using green propulsion technology. We're using a thing called peroxide bleach, H2O2. When you break it down, it breaks down to water and oxygen. You use that to combust rubber, 96% combustion, and that launches the rocket. When we used to joke we were part jet fighter, part race car, part spaceship, we now are, in that that is part of the North Star program, and that is being designed to launch nanosat and cube satellites into orbit. And why they're interested in us? We're pumping peroxide at 50 kilos a second using a race car engine. We're refueling this car in 45 minutes. So not only does Andy do a measured mile, does 11 mile run, he turns around in a quite a large U-turn, because it's turning circles pretty rubbish. We then refuel it, so we refuel it with 450 liters of jet fuel, 800 liters of high test peroxide, change the rocket. Now when they launch a space rocket, they spend days with guys in spacesuits fueling up. That's trivializing a bit, because they've got a lot more nasty chemicals, and they've got a lot bigger space rocket. If you can get rocket launches down to two a day, three a day, four a day, all of a sudden, satellites become cheap, economic. You can actually game change. Satellites will be this big. There is a technology in your mobile phone that could be made into satellites. The universe is working on that technology. The issue is, how do you get them to space? Booking a slot with SpaceX, with Ariane, massively expensive. Firing them from within Europe on a cheap rocket will change the, the way things are going. We have a jet engine, so we have Eurofighter Typhoon. So the issue we have with this in that we go 200 miles an hour faster than Eurofighter Typhoon can go at the altitude we're running at. We're pushing the boundaries of what's possible. And we can share everything. We aren't a Formula One team. The rules we have to follow are so, are so small. There are four paragraphs. It has to have four or more wheels, and it has to be in control, and it has to do two runs in an hour. And that's pretty much it. And everything else you do is up to you, the engineer, the designer, the scientist, the mathematician, the physicist. And you can play around with this to your heart's content and see if that will do better or worse. And the best thing is you can download all our data off the website. So we have a website, all the CAD data is there. It's a year old at the moment. In about two weeks' time, the car we are running in South Africa, all the geometry there is available. You can download a thing called jt to go You can put it all together. You can take the bits. You can measure it. You can do whatever you like. We're now in the stage where we're putting it all together. It's like this huge airfix kit of stuff. And it's handmade. This is made by guys with huge experience of different shapes. And the funny thing is, the, we're based in Bristol. We, we lived next to Ardwin Animations. So the guys did Wallace and Gromit. And their guy, Dave Sproxton, came in. And he basically said to us, this is such a cool project. What can we do to help? And we said, oh, yeah, we don't really need little plasticine men and this, that, and the other. They're going to do like Morph. Morph does supersonic car. Um, but one of their commercial directors said, no, this is fantastic, I want to document it. And if you look in the bottom panel, there's a caricature. That's done by Ardman Animation, and that's inside the car. And that's a caricature of all the guys that built the car that's within it forever. So we're to South Africa next year. Next year, we're trying to get credibly supersonic, so around about 800 miles an hour. That's a huge learning point as we get there. We're running on the flattest place on Earth. That place was found using Google Earth. Google Earth and some NASA public domain software that basically tells you what all the little peaks and troughs are. So Swansea University wrote a little bit of program. Let's look for disks that are 20 kilometer circles that were within a meter of altitude. It then looked at Google Earth and said, is it blue? If it's blue, that's rubbish, it's the sea, throw it away. Is it green? That's rubbish, it's treetops, throw that away. If it's brown, that's great, it's probably a desert. Let's, let's have a look at that. And is it white? And if it's white, you then flick the spectrum, and you say, is it ice or is it salt? Now, Andy's a brave guy, but ice is probably a bit crazy, especially when you've got 60 foot of flame out the back of the car. Um, but salt, salt's worth a look at. And that came up with some like 30 places on Earth that nobody ever thought of again before for running a land speed record car on. And we are there, Hackskeen Pan, Northern Cape Province. And the amount of development and stuff that's going into there because we're going there has changed how they live and changed how they work. So next year, Andy Green is going to push up to 800, 850. And people go, is that going to be successful? When you go to 1,000 miles an hour, is that going to be successful? Success is based on what impact we have. The actual success of the project, our number one goal is to get kids excited about science, technology, engineering, maths. Our second goal is to give them all the material to make that available. We're, 
We're rounding something like 6,000 schools now, and over the next two years, that's mushrooming to 50 regional hubs with cars like you saw outside that are interactive. And that's all coming on. And our third goal is to break a land speed record. Now, if we achieve that, we don't need nations of supersonic car designers. We need guys that understand the problems, that can design bridges, infrastructure, power generation. People that, if they're an economist or a scientist or a mathematician or an accountant or a politician, can understand the technical nuances, the questions of, do we need wind turbines? Do we need nuclear power? Do we need high-speed rail? All these things. And the whole idea of this project is to give you the inspiration to actually think about doing that. Now, for me, I grew up not a million miles from here on the flight path to Heathrow. When I was in my primary school, we had a porter cabin classroom in the playground. 1972, Concorde came over for its first ever landing. And it literally shook the porter cabin so things fell off the walls. So we ran out, two classes, ran out to this playroom, looked up, and there's Concorde for the first time going over. Now, I became an apprentice with well, British Aerospace, as was. It was um, Hawker Siddeley Aviation. And I, I went into a career in aerospace. Now, was that anything to do with being a six-year-old standing out looking at this fantastic thing? No idea. But the whole idea of this project is to be the concord for this generation that everyone can get behind. Thank you very much. Now, uh, I'm going to let you in on a little spoiler. Uh, next month's edition of Wired, we've, we went down to Bristol and we kind of went inside the car. We, we're, we're running a, a little story on what you guys are doing. Uh, and I, having, having, I can speak from experience that it's pretty astonishing physics involved. I mean, Andy Green, who's the pilot, is an Air Force pilot with thousands of hours of uh, experience. Uh, will tell you that when you're trying to break from 1,000 miles an hour, isn't it something like it's, you're going, losing 60 miles an hour a second? So that's like having a car crash go through your body every second. So at 3G, that's the opposite of what Tim Peake goes through in a shuttle launch in the other direction through your body. Uh, but the thing I want to ask you about is uh, talk a little bit about more, more about South Africa, because you guys are, well, what happens if a rock in the South African desert hits a car at 1,000 miles an hour? It's really bad. <laughs> so, 1,000 miles an hour, it's joking, but it isn't. That's faster than a speeding bullet. If you choose the right gun, 1,000 miles an hour, so if you've got a 357 Magnum, Dirty Harry, the muzzle velocity of that is slower than our car. A sniper rifle, if they fired over a mile, the car would beat the bullet. So if a stone gets flicked up and hits the car, it's like somebody shot you with a bullet. So we've had, we've been clearing everything bigger than a marble off that desert over the last two years. And it is the world's flattest surface. And it's interesting about the resonance. We are, people go, well, they're going to, what happens if the car hits a little bump? The car weighs seven and a half tons. It's going 1,000 miles an hour that way. That little bump is not going to be a problem. What is a problem, though, is a wave that's 150 metres long. Because that will make, even if it's only 50 millimetres, that will just make the car start to go up and down and will cause the suspension to go into resonance. So we're having it, la we're laser scanning it. And to give an idea of how flat this desert is, over two kilometers, the highest peak to the lowest trough is 60 millimeters. And that's flat, that's better than my kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to me a little bit about um, like where you are in the project now. So you're, you're gonna be going out there next year. I think you're testing it in the UK first, is that right? Yeah, so the car's in, in manufacture, so we've designed the car, all on computer. We've made the car using huge amounts of different support and companies in the UK. Um, that's in construction at the moment. So by Christmas, pretty much the cars, the external, the exterior of the car's finished. Um, we'll be runway testing the UK around about July, August next year, down in um, Newquay. It used to be RF St. Morgan, so it's one of the longest runways in the southwest. We can get the car to about 200 miles an hour. We then fly from Newquay straight to Uppington, which is south of Hackskeen Pan in sort of September, October next year. And how are you guys are completely open source, so if you ever want to play with the car design or anything, there are actually these files, you can do it, but how can everyone here get involved? So we've got a great website, bloodhoundssc.com. There's a supporters club on there. If you got, there's a whole link section for schools to get involved. Um, there's all the usual Twitter, Facebook, all those things. Just start looking for, 
it used to be when we started Bloodhound, you got Bloodhound Gang came up as the big thing. You know, you've got lots of pictures of dogs. Um, now Bloodhound SSC comes up. We're on the BBC site. We've got so much stuff out there. There are so many great videos. And we're releasing two videos a month that are educational. Little things about what's aerodynamics, what's this, what's that. Why do the wheels go at 10,500 RPM? There's always, it's so nice to work on a project that you can tell people what you're doing. Because before this, you kind of work on these companies and, you know, Formula One teams. We meet a lot of them and they go, well, we can't really tell you what we're doing. We can't, we can't really say what was going on. It's so refreshing to be in somewhere where I can go to a school and I can say, this is what we're doing and here's a bit of it. And here's how you can help. It's an amazing project and we all wish you the best of luck. Thanks again, Mark Chapman from Bloodhound. Thank you.